on the road less traveled with Gary L and Gigi's Boo on reallibertymedia.com RLM Radio. Hello Gigi's Boo, how you doing? Hi Gary, doing pretty good. good. How about you? I'm doing great. Good to hear that you're doing okay. Yeah, we have all kinds of things going on tonight. Big show, We've got lots to talk about. But we want to talk about Akis. Akis, you took him to get washed and rinsed and clipped. Oh, and my gracious. He, w- he went in and he had to be washed, wrenched, and cut. And he was just fit to be tied. He just did not want to go. And I told him he had to get it, he had to get washed behind his ears. But what you didn't know about and what he didn't know about was what might have been inside of this aquarium. That was nearby where the uh, door, I guess nearby the door, the entrance or something. There was something in the aquarium. He didn't see the aquarium that was right inside the door. I think he was looking around, kind of plotting his thing and saying, Oh, dear God, is this dead dog walking? You know, where is this? This doesn't look like the vet's office, but what am I here for? And when I left him, he, he didn't like that. And so when we started out, the aquarium was there, and he was wanting to hurry up and get out, and I was talking to the lady that owned the pet shop, and there were two snakes in there, and I said, what are those snakes? They're awful pretty. They were. They were brown and maybe a cream color, a tan and cream color. She said they were hognose. And so he stood up on his hind legs and looked at them, and anybody that's followed us and followed the history of our rascally rabbit knows he hates snakes. He can't stand a snake. So he stood up, and he looked at me and looked. I said, no, come on. You're not going to miss the, the snakes. Let's go. And so he went over, and he was mad, and he was going to pee on her potted plant. And I said, no, you're not. Come on. So uh, he kicked at it, and we got out in the car, and, he, of course, he wanted to stop on the way. And I said, no, just for showing out, you're going to have to hold it till you get home. So I made him wait, and he didn't like that in the least. So when he got mm. out, I think he peed on every pole we got in the yard. <laughs> yeah, get your washcloth, Graham. Wash it. And Rob, that's it. Wash it up. Wash it. Let's wash it good. Wash that car. That's it. <laughs> Did you yeah. wash fine them ears? That's right. We did that. Hey, that's that chat room you're talking to. We know about the chat room over here on Real Liberty Media. Dot com. So come to reallibertymedia.com about halfway down the front page. The front page, you'll see an entry point for the chat room at RLM. And happy to see you coming to the chat like everyone else that's in here. And then, you know, that's Grimner and Moose Girl and Kate and Asmo and Beth and Chalstony and Circle and Chloe and Free and Slave and Graham C. I be Don C. Java Doctor, JJ, Wanda Tuggle, Meister Brow, Rain, R. Rob Works. <laughs> I almost did it. Trust No One and Beetle and Behind the Woodshed, who was here from 3 to 5 on with his show. Colfax, Dima, Dork Matter, Frumpy, Gigi's Boo, Go, uh, Gooberzilla, Kozu, Meister Brow, Moe, Poxified, Pawnsaw, Slim Jim, Flim, Teddy, and Phantom 2. What happened to Phantom 1? Eh? What? He got replaced. Maybe Phantom 2 is one of those bots. Oh, no. So what do you think, Gigi's Boo? What's, what else is going on? Oh, not much, except what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to carry over a little bit with the Appalachians mm-hmm. and talk a little bit about spring tonics. Mm-hmm. And and if you don't take your spring tonic, you might need the sin eater. Yeah, you might need a so, bit worse, too. <laughs> you need that wash, that face wash, <laughs> and the whole nine yards. But it's going to be a, quite a good show tonight. I well, think. we got a lot to go with. And so I guess I better move kind of quickly here. I have about a, about a million tabs up here on the screen and let's talk first about last week we talked about you know cutting that blanket and sewing it on the other end of daylight savings time and all that good stuff well what about this whole concept that now places are trying to make daylight savings time permanent and eh? there's actually florida 
legislation. But it was 100 years ago, 100 years ago, that Congress came up with this idea of daylight savings time. Florida now wants to make it all the time. If they do that, that will make them in the same time zone as those who are in the Atlantic Standard Time. For those who've never heard of the Atlantic Standard Time, that's where places like Nova Scotia, they are on a different hour ahead. So Miami and Jacksonville will be on the same timeline as Nova Scotia instead of New York and Washington. How much sense does that make? Florida seems to be gone off the deep end, but we'll talk a little bit more about that later. And, of course, the legislators down in Florida are saying it's going to put more sunshine in their lives. Hmm. They know something else in their lives besides sunshine. (laughs) Despite the name, though, Daylight Savings Time has never saved anyone anything. But, on the other hand, it's proven to be a fantastically effective retail spending plan. Yes, this article talks in the conversation.com, talks about the history of daylight savings time and how the railroads had some input into that. And then Germany decided that they, in 1916, want to adopt a British idea in hopes of conserving energy for its war effort. Now, let me get this straight. They were in a war with Great Britain, but they're going to adopt the idea. And despite a fanatical opposition from the farm lobby, so would the United States. The United States got into this. We called it our patriotic duty. Congress also, though, tacked on the legal mandate for the four continental time zones. Well, that's where your time zones came from. I mean, he knew that. Then the rationale kind of went like this. Shifting one hour of available light from the very early morning when most people are asleep, that would reduce the demand for domestic electrical power used to illuminate homes in the evening, which would spare more energy for the war effort. That's an interesting idea. Woodrow Wilson in 1918 signed the Calder Act and required Americans to set their clocks to standard time less than two weeks later. On March 31st, they would be required to abandon standard time and push the clocks ahead for the first experiment with daylight savings. But it didn't work out so well. In 1918, Easter Sunday fell on March 31st, which led to a lot of latecomers to church services. Oh no, people got mad, and they blamed daylight savings time for subverting sun time or God's time. See how, in hell, see how this thing spins out of control, yeah? And it just goes on and on. I highly recommend that you read this. But today we know that changing the clock influences our behavior. For example, later sunset times have dramatically increased participation in after-school sports programs and attendance at professional sports events. Hmm. In 1920, the Washington Post reported that golf ball sales increased by 20% as a result of the change in time. When Congress extended daylight savings from six to seven months in 1986, the golf industry estimated that the extra month was was worth as much as $400 million in additional equipment sales and green fees. This just gets crazier as we go along. In 1974, President Nixon forced Floridians and the entire nation into a year-round daylight savings in a vain attempt to stave off energy crisis and lessen the impact of the so-called OPEC oil embargo. Interesting article talks about the nuts, nuts, nuts that goes on around these, these little tempests in a teapot that makes you keep your clock in a certain place all the time. <laughs> it's just, Gigi, what is up with all this craziness? I think they're just crazy myself. Just leave the time, do like the Indians. Sun comes up, get up. When it goes down, go to bed. That's right. And speaking of Florida, as most people who listen to the show or come to Real Liberty Media, they're already aware that Florida now has this bill, this law or whatever, that says that you have to be 21 years old to have a rifle. Okay, that's interesting because a lot of people don't know this, and it's not something that's spoken of quite often. A lot of people don't know that most of us, or most of, not me anymore, but most of the people out there are in the militia, whether you like it or not. United States Code says 
that you are in the militia, specifically chapter 13 of Title 10 of the United States Code. Paragraph 311 talks about what the militia is. One of the classes of militia, of course, is the organized militia, which consists of the National Guard and the Naval Militia. But then you have subparagraph 2, which says the unorganized militia, which consists of the members of the militia who are not members of National Guard and Naval Militia. That means everyone else. And if you're at least 17 years of age, chapter 13, paragraph 311, if you're at least 17 years of age and you're not accepted and you're under 45 years of age, who are a citizen of the United States or have made a declaration of intent to become a citizen, and female citizens of the United States who are members of the National Guard. If you fall with 17 and 45 and you're not exempted, you're in the militia, one way or the other, whether you like it or not. And guess what? Florida says you have to be 21. Well, under the concept of the Second Amendment, where it says a well-regulated militia, regulated meaning that everyone has the same arms, the same ammunition, has the same training effectively, you're in the militia. But how can Florida's law stand then? Because it's in direct conflict with Title 10, Chapter 13, Paragraph 311. But what about exemptions? Okay, you can be exempted if you're the vice president, you're a judicial and executive officer of the United States in several states, the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Virgin Islands. You're already a member of the armed forces, except members who are not on active duty, if you're a custom house clerk, if you're a person employed by the United States in the transmission of mail, if you're a workman employed in armories, arsenals, and naval shipyards in the United States, if you're a pilot on navigable waters, or a mariner in the sea service of a citizen of or a merchant in the United States. Everyone else is in the militia, except you're still in the militia, but you can claim conscientious objection based on your religious beliefs, that you're still in the militia, but you cannot be placed in a combative capacity. So, like it or not, you sit there and whine and suck on your Tide Pods and walk around with your signs and say, I don't like this. This hurts my feelings. You can say it all you like. According to the letter of the law, you are probably in the militia. So, Suck on that Tide Pod, snowflakes. And in support of that, though, a lot of people don't realize that there is an organization that is organized under the United States Department of Defense. Now, this is in line with the constitutional authority that they create something called a civilian marksmanship program. And it's been around for a very long time. And what you can do there is you can take classes, you can go to competitions, you can buy surplus M1 carbines and M1 Garants, you can buy M1911 45 caliber pistols that are surplus, and very, very legally, and the only, the only condition is that you're a member of a, of a recognized club, and that is a very broad definition. And they have communications and competitions and training and all this stuff. The Civilian Marksmanship Program. And there is your answer to the well-regulated statement in the Constitution. So I'll send links to that as well. Pretty interesting. A lot of people are going to jump up and down. So I ain't no militia. Yeah, you are. You're a citizen. You're a militia. <laughs> Gigi's boo, what you think about that? <laughs> I think it's funny myself. It is funny. It's funny because these are realities that you never hear about. No one wants to talk about this. No, uh -uh. that's not that. That's not my reality. No, sorry to hate to hate to bust your bubble, Snowflake. Yes, it is. Let's see if any response from the chat room. That's the conscriptable militia, which is everyone. And whether you like it or not, as Hal says, the conscriptable militia, everyone is in it. And that's the club that you are in. <laughs> that's the club. 
Ah, what about YouTube, though? Well, I just wanted to go ahead and change my page. You're talking about, you know, here's YouTube at it again, according to Yahoo.com, their news. YouTube is trying to crack down on what they call conspiracy videos. Ooh. But they don't tell you much about what the details are of that. You know, there are videos out there about the earth being flat and shootings being staged and all this kind of stuff and propaganda and fake news and all that. But apparently, YouTube seems to want to think that they are going to crack down on these so-called conspiracy videos. But nobody's saying exactly what a conspiracy video is. I guess we must fall into that category, Gigi's boo. I know we do. I guess we must be some of them wild conspiracy theorists out there. I know we are. We must be because... Last week's show, and some of you have probably seen this note, this uh, notice that I put out since. But last week's show that centered around this, uh, this social services young lady who was fired for what reasons were certainly debatable. She claims it was because she was a concealed carry permit holder, but probably because within the title of last week's archive it says "Be a concealed pistol permit holder and get fired." YouTube restricted that archive. It has received, as of this moment, a blistering 63 views, partly due to the fact that it's marked as restricted. But not all their stuff is restricted, and they still don't get many views, but just a, a direct comparison over on BitChute, the very, very same archive that was actually posted about an hour later than YouTube's, has 6,600 views. So it has a thousand times more views than the archive on YouTube. Never mind the fact that it's only been publishing archives on BitChute for about four months in comparison to the Real Liberty Media's presence on YouTube, which I assure you is far longer than four months. How interesting is that? What is that all about? Huh, can't imagine, Gigi's boo. Can't imagine. What do you think about that? Oh, they're going to censor. You know they are. Yeah. And, and they, they're they they're doing that. But, you know, that's your, they can censor all they want to. Uh, your First Amendment says freedom of speech. Well, that's part of it. But the whole point is, I you know, if they want to censor, that's fine. They're a private, corporate platform with terms of service and all that stuff but be honest about it don't sneak around like a like the maggots that you are and censor things and shadow ban things and restrict things because you think you can get away with it well obviously you can't get away with it because you have a direct side by side comparison that you, that any moron would see there's a problem here with that. So YouTube, you're you're going away, and that's fine. I'm looking forward to it. Things like BitChute and DTube, or yeah, DTube is a steam it thing. It's, you know, that's all these things are coming to replace you. So all you all you shareholders and YouTube and all that, you probably want to get out while the getting's good. I highly recommend it because you're you're on the way down down. In the ring of fire, Johnny Cash would say. Well, but Gigi's boo, what do you think about all this craziness? Well, I've told you for a long time that the world's crazy. We're the only sane ones, and the people in the chat room are the only sane ones in the world anymore. That's right. But I guess all this goes to show, yes, we must be conspiracy theorists. Oh, my God. Well, I'll tell you this. If I'm a conspiracy theorist, that, that means the ones on the other side of the fence are coincidence theorists. That everything just happens as a coincidence. Yeah, Gremner, we too old be militia. We, we, we just, we just, we just sit on the sidelines, and we, we can, we can fill up the, we can fill up the the rifles and hand them off to somebody else. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yeah, we can sit and we can we can drink some moonshine. That way we don't have to worry about it. any of this stuff. Anyway, let's move on here real quickly because I'm on the, we got a whole lot to go over. And let's move fast. Okay, what do I got here? I had to study. Da, da, da. 
Uh, talk about vaccines. We we like to we like this issue and talk about conspiracy theories, a soft kill associated with vaccines, and a whole lot of other things that we've mentioned in the past. But for those people out there who are always running into these folks, that there's no evidence, and there's no evidence that any kind of harm comes from vaccines. No, well, guess what? The U.S. Court of Claims, pretty good evidence, I think, has found in that particular case of uh, sudden infant death syndrome. And there'll be a link for this for you can show to all your negative Nellies out there. And the quote from the finding from the, from the judge's decision. In this case, I have concluded after review of the evidence that it is more likely than not that the vaccines played a substantial causal role in the death of the young baby in question, without the effect of which he would not have died. Without the effect of which, speaking of the vaccines, he would not have died. Now, what else do you need to know? There'll be a link to that entire article and a link to, with that has a link directly to the the court finding. And all they talk about the 5G cell towers that Al was talking about in his show, Behind the Woodshed, from 3 to 5 today. He was talking about the, the whole 5G thing, too. But, you know, you think you have local authority. And, of course, one of the amazing abilities we have is to connect locally and become a voice. It's said that the most authority you have is locally. Well, guess what? They're ahead of you on that one. Because as this, as as has come up in Middleburg, Virginia, 5G cell towers, new legislation strips citizen authority on where they can be built. Long story short, they are lobbying the state legislature to pass a law that strips localities of the ability to regulate the placement of cell towers. See, they're thinking ahead. They, they're way ahead of the power curve on this one. And they talk about the fact that there's a well-funded and powerful lobby. Well, guess what? We knew that. And they're looking to change the face of our hometown. And this is written from the perspective of someone from Middleburg. In the name of better coverage. And it just goes on to talk about what 5G is all about. And also says that the Middleburg Town Council is doing everything they can do to push back against the bills. In January, we unanimously voted on a resolution opposing their passage and have sent letters to the Senators Kane and Warner voicing our concerns. Good luck with that. We ask that every member of our community make your voices heard by writing to the members of the Senate, House of Delegates, and our new governor, Ralph Northam, urging him to veto any bill that may pass. So you see, this is going on. This is real. And it would appear, at least on the surface, that the people in Middleburg have some influence with their local government. That's a good thing. Doesn't surprise me a whole lot because if you if you're familiar at all with Middleburg, it's a pretty high income, I guess, area. It's very historic. Lots of horse people in Middleburg. This is the war in the trenches that we talked about in the past. And we're gonna hold it right there because we're right at the halfway through point. GG's boo, and we have a whole lot more to go through. Okay, okay. So let's talk a minute. I'll introduce this segment of the show. It's a little bit more about local remedies. Let's talk about hard tack. I mean, Gigi, we've heard of hard tack. Everybody who's, yeah. everybody who's watched rolling, 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 keep them doggies rolling, heard of hard tack. And if you're a Civil War buff, you've heard of hard tack. But what the heck is hard tack? It's a survival bread. And here's a recipe, and I'll share how to make it. Pretty interesting, pretty easy to make. Survival bread that's held up well to rough transport, kept nearly indefinitely. It was on ships and during the golden age of sailing, and it was a staple on board a ship. It's really, really hard. I mean, they, they call it hard tack for a reason. It's very hard. But the way you eat it, you soak it in coffee, or you put it in beer, or you fry it in oil, or you beat it up in the crumbs and put it into a soup. And that's all kinds of things you can do with it. But how? what it's made of is pretty simple. It's flour, water, and salt. That's all there is to it. And the recipe here on how to make it, two and a half cups of flour, one cup of water, and one tablespoon of salt. And that's how you put it together. And you 
you roll it and you cut it and you poke it like it looks like a saltine cracker, a very, a very thick one. Mm-hmm. It's probably a good way to describe its looks. And it talks about how you can store it. You can vacuum seal or you can put it in mason jars and store it, you know, however you want to store it. Also, which I won't get into, it's this hardtack meat alternative, something called pemmican. And there's a recipe here for that as well. So we'll pass it along if you guys want to experiment with that. Or perhaps make a little batch and set it aside, but it'll last for a very long time. Okay, Gigi's boo. Now we're going to turn the show over to the bear. We'll the bear. The bear, the bear. Go talk to us about all kinds of fun stuff about living in the Appalachians, but you don't have to live in the Appalachians to do this. You can oh, be no. You can be prepared by learning these simple little tricks this, and, and little recipes that she's going to share up with you. So go ahead, yeah. Gigi's boo. Well, you know, we're all ready for spring, all of us, in the warm breezes, pretty blue skies, the flowers popping their heads out from under the stiff, frosty soil, all those things. And after a long winter, everybody is ready for all this, but is your body ready? Now, the Appalachian people have a different view on lots of things, and as you probably already know from talking to just Gary and I, we are a little bit off the beaten path, period, with certain things. And the Appalachian people believed in all kind of concoctions and tonics and blood cleansers and the whole nine yards that some of the, the Native Americans. And it ran simply on the seasons. They thought when the sap in the trees went down, the blood became thicker and lower because of the cold weather and the slowed down lifestyle. You didn't do as much in the winter as you did in the spring and the summer. And a poor diet of canned or dried foods, along with some salted meat, was not the healthiest thing that you could do for yourself. So therefore, you had to cleanse the blood come spring. So here come the spring's tonics. And the tonics help the sluggish blood that was thick and lower to rise up, just like the sap does in spring, for the preparation of hard work to be done during the growing season. Now, two of the options, and the most popular one that you're going to hear mainly with the Appalachian people, is sulfur and molasses. Now, I don't know how many of y'all in the chat room know what molasses are. I think most everybody's heard of sorghum or you've heard of blackstrap. Molasses are a wonderful, wonderful thing. They're simply made from pure sugar cane. And back where Gary and I come from, people had molasses mills. And it's not just dumping all the stuff into a pot and making it. It's a long, drawn-out process. The fire has to be just right. The cooker on top has to be just right. The only way that I can tell you how the cooker looks on top, it looks like a maze, but just a maze going one way, not winding in and out short places. The whole pan that you would cook the molasses in had different section slots in it. You cut the cane and you'd strip the fodder and you'd tie the cane up and then it was taken to the mill where it was ground and the juice was extracted. Now, this was done simply by tying a mule or a paschal of young'uns, if you had them and didn't have a mule, to the mill, and it went around and around in a circle, and it ground the cane, pressed it, and the pure cane juice came out and was collected. Then it was taken over to the cooker, and it was put into the first side of the cooker. Now, this side would be just slightly warm, and you would stir it a little bit on that. Then you you used a long, it looked like a great big hoe, and you just stirred it with that. And then when you thought you had it just about right. Now, making molasses is an art. Not many people can do it. It's like making moonshine. you got to know what you're doing. It's not done in one time. It takes practice through the years to get it just right. Then they swift it over to the next section, which would be a little warmer. And it was there for a little bit. And they swished it to the next section, which would be hot. There it cooked, and it went over to a hotter section, another hotter section. Then you went to cooling it off again. It would go to a warmer section and then to a cool section. And by that time, it had cooked, and you had real, real thick molasses that are absolutely wonderful 
eating alone with some butter mixed in with it and some good hot biscuits. It's wonderful. But the Appalachian people mixed molasses with sulfur from the sulfur flour. And they learned through the years that the, the sulfur is sublimed sulfur or flowers of sulfur. Now, we all know that sulfur is in the nucleus of a cell, and it's fundamental to regeneration of strong, healthy tissue. Some of the mixes, they added a little cream of tartar. That was later on down the line, and a little bit of powdered pearl. The name molasses is derived from a Portuguese word called melico, which means resembling honey. Unsulfured molasses tastes stronger and has more nutrients. Sulfur-treated molasses is sweeter but has fewer nutrients. But the sulfur is to purify the blood. Now, I said something to Gary, and he wanted me to bring this up. That, and there was three little moles that went in the hole. The first little mole went in the hole, and he said, he sniffed. He said, I smell sugar. Second little mole ran in the hole, and he sniffed. I smell honey. And the third little mole that went in the hole said, I smell molasses. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so molasses is very important to the Appalachian people. That's exactly where that joke came from. That's told around the table of the Appalachian people for a long time. The tonic is to get the blood up going and keeping the body revigorated, like I said, to cleanse the blood to get it ready for the long, hard season. I don't think they had daylight savings time back then, but they <laughs> still worked long and hard in those fields growing stuff, making moonshine if they had to. But one way or the other, molasses and sulfurs was used. They had tonics, too. They have a spring tonic, and one of the favorite spring teas was sassafras. Now, Gary's going to interrupt me a little bit through here well, to that, explain... That, that, yeah, let me go ahead and talk okay. about why why sulfur. You talked about the fact that sulfur and molasses. None of these things happen by accident. You know, all this, all these con, all these beliefs that this is just mountain lore and it's just superstitious and blah blah blah. It's all a bunch of crap because and here we go. Our conspiracy theorists, <laughs> our con, our coincidence theorists would say that that's just that's just you know malarkey. Well, guess what? What does sulfur do for you, and how might it actually have a relationship to warmer weather? Well, as we suggested offline before the show, that the major way that your body cools itself is how, G.G.'s blue? Well, it, it cools itself through the blood. Right. And yeah. through sweating, and the, and the blood makes you sweat. And... Right. And so it would be sensible to have a good blood supply a good blood flow during hot weather, right? That's right. Well, the, the many biological roles of sulfur, in addition to bonding proteins, it's also required for the proper structure and biological activity of enzymes. If you don't have enough sulfur in your body, enzymes will not function properly and can cause a cascade of health effects. But since your metabolic processes rely on biologically active enzymes, also plays an important role in part of the iron sulfur proteins and mitochondria, the energy factories of your cells, synthesizes important metabolic intermediates such as glutathione, one of the more important antioxidants that your body produces, and also in detoxification. All these things are important. And it works uh, in conjunction with cholesterol and vitamin D. Mm -hmm. So sulfur is the third most prevalent element in the crust of the earth. This information goes on to explain how the sun exposure helps optimize cardiovascular health. So one thing leads to another, right? And so exactly your, right. your sulfur content helps you process your vitamin D sulfate when exposed to sunlight. So in addition to all these benefits, this explains, I guess, the history behind creating a tonic of sulfur and molasses would be something that people would do in the springtime, right, Jiggy's Blue? 
That's right. And you might want to touch on about how the molasses are rich in all this stuff, the minerals and everything, too. They're very rich in iron and vitamin A and Bs and all that. It's very, very good stuff. So, yeah. And why we talk about this? Because you need to be able to take care of yourself locally. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, you're, that's not, true. you're not going to go to the store and buy a pre-made tonic of sulfur and molasses. Not going to happen. That's <laughs> not that's not on anybody's radar. But it better be on your radar because what happens when you don't have a store to go to? They did a lot of spring tonics, and sassafras was one, spice bush, and sweet birch. But sassafras is a root that grows different places. The white root grows in a different area than the red root sassafras. Mama just told me a little while ago that her grandmother would not use anything but the red sassafras, and she got it off the north side of the mountain. That's where she got her sassafras. Also, in the spring, they ate and gathered a lot of greens, and they had a real good detoxification too, a cleansing and were, and had a lot of iron in it, especially poke grains. I don't know if y'all know what poke salad is or not, but it's just a plant that grows up and you get the leaves and you just parboil them and you eat them and you gather the berries. The berries are good too. Now, there's, they're not used for internal use, but they can be used for a lot of skin ailments. One of them was what old folks call the seven-year itch. Well, there's nothing no more than the scabies in modern day. And what you did is you boil some of them poke berries and throw it down in that tin tub that you was going to take a bath. Now, you might come out purple like the poke berry, but the itch is not going to stay with you. They also gathered wild asparagus, dandelion, dock, wild onion, ramps, and nettles. Now, ramps are similar to wild onions. And it also said that they gathered a lot of watercress and what was the name of the lettuce, Scary? And I can't go off the top of my head. I, I've seen my grandmother get it, but I'm not exactly sure. It's a lettuce that grows wild. Now, you can't get that lettuce on the branch banks. I don't know if y'all know the difference, and I'm sure you know the difference between a creek and a river, but I don't know if people know what the Appalachian people mean when we say we got a creek and we got a branch. A creek is a bigger moving body of water, and a branch just trickles along. And that's where the lettuce would come from, was from the branch, not the creek. All those would be used along with the spice bush and, like I said, the sweet birch. And it improved an overhaul health. And that's simply what they were after in that tonic, any tonic. And it's mostly plant-based and it's preventative medical remedies aimed at improving your overall health. Yeah. So we do that, but let's go down here and I'm going to go over some. The mountain people love to make sassafras tea. They still do. And they'll drink it. They'll sit around and it's it's got a different taste. It almost tastes a little bit like licorice to me. Everybody else says it tastes like something different to them. They also used a lot of wild cherry and they made bitters from it. That's similar to what they make cocktails. And they said it really did benefit their health along with echinacea, which uh, touted contemporary times as an immunity and booster. It, it boosted your immune system. Now, here are some recipes. You take 77 willow leaves, boil down in water to a pint of liquid is good for chills. That would be probably a fever. Ginseng was to have a lot of properties, and you don't hear too many people talk about ginseng, but it was used a lot for women's menstrual periods. Another one for women was used, you boil the inside of the bark of a sweet apple tree and use it as a tonic. If a woman was flowing too much, the bark must be scraped upwards from the tree. You go up, if too little, downward. There was an herbalist in Pineville, Missouri, said that a tonic mixture of whiskey, tansy, and ragweed leaves was indicated in such cases. I take it every day myself. 
and it agrees with me fine. And he said, I ain't had the hiccups but once in 14 years. So I would imagine he took that for the digestive system. A real strong tea of red clover blossoms is regarded in some quarters as a blood purifier and general tonic. I do know that some of the Appalachian people who didn't have wild honey used the clover along with some other things and sort of made their own honey. I've never seen it but one time. It tasted real good. The red clover tea is also used for whooping cough. But if the whooping cough is really, really bad, it'll help it if you take mare's milk. And it says in the lower that many a father has been routed out in the middle of the night to ride to a farm where mare's milk could be found where a mare had recently folded. Now, I had never heard that. And I have my grandmother's medicine book here. And she never said anything about that. Now, bloodroot is also supposed to be great blood remedy, apparently because it's red and the sap's red. But at the same time, the leaf is shaped like a kidney, a liver, an ovary. And so it's a remedy for all those disorders of those organs. So that's a good thing to know, too. Except, I will say this, bloodroot now is on the endangered species. You can't gather it anymore. Ginseng, like I said, plus cherry bark and yellow root is a potent tonic as long as you take it along with a little whiskey. Whiskey has always been a tonic in the Appalachian Mountains. And I know some of you will remember the Hadacol and Geritol. Geritol didn't have any alcohol in it, but Hadacol did. And a lot of people would not take anything until they took their Hadacol that night to go to bed because they said put all their minerals and everything back in your stomach and everything. But like I said, corn whiskey was common, and it was used really sometimes, and it was fiend. People fiend illnesses so they could get it. Mixture of whiskey and honey was used to treat anything from toothache, sore throats, and minor stomach ailments. And there it goes around, and it says that it, whiskey played an, a role in making tonics and blood thinners and things of that sort. It came on and people patented all this stuff and they went on and they made lots of different things with it, which if you will see now, you will not ever, ever find. You can't even find Geritol on the drugstore shelf anymore. You can't find Hadacol, period. I just thought, well, you know, before you know it, they'll take Dr. Tinchers off the market because Dr. Tinchers is 70% alcohol and a little bit of water, and 10% mint oil, which is another thing I want to talk about. I want to tell you about mint. Somebody was talking about mint was real good for the digestive tract, and it really is because we've had many things to do as kids, and we would find wild mint growing around the creek banks and things, and we would pull it, and we would go down to the creek or to the, to the really a spring's better, you chew that mint and take you a good, good drink out of that spring. That's the most refreshing drink you'll ever take. And it's it's really good. Gary, you want to come in and do a little bit on these things that I've talked about and give them a little background on it? You would want to do that. Yeah, and that, that's that's great, Gigi's boo. And that's the whole point of this is, and, you know, I know people really, a lot of people don't want to hear it because I'll just go down to the food line and I can get what I know. What if you can't? What if you can't? What if you don't have access to those things? What are you going to do? What You can just go ahead and die. That's your option. There aren't many others. So it behooves us to understand these, what we call these old school ways of doing things that aren't really that crazy to begin with because many of them are based in scientific fact. For example... Sassafras. There has always been a big controversy about sassafras, of all things. They wanted to outlaw and ban and all these sorts of things. But the benefits of sassafras, and there are some, there are some drawbacks. There are drawbacks to everything. So you have to. This is why you have to be smart about this stuff. The benefits of sassafras is that they could be an effective treatment for certain cancers like gastric and liver and leukemia and tongue and oral and breast and prostate and, and lung cancer. All these things. And also, the camphor that is present in a small amount in sassafras helps protect against the spread of colon cancer. You and can, pay attention to what he said, because colon cancer is on the rise. 
Yeah. So sassafras tea would help that. Yeah. You, you can, can sometimes buy it in grocery stores. Just be sure it's not one of those wacky kind. Yeah. And sassafras, you can treat parasitic diseases. These typically occur in tropical and subtropical climates, such as southern Europe. But an extract from sassafras abedum bark is used on parasites. And it seems to be able to kill them without negatively affecting nearby cells. It may help manage diabetes. A diabetic diet plan can include sassafras, and it's been shown in rat studies to have an impact on insulin production. It's a natural acetylcholine sterinase inhibitor. And that's for those who know what that is, you'll understand what the benefit is, such as treating glaucoma, poise, certain poisonings, and schizophrenia, of all things. Here we get to the bottom line <clears throat> with respect to springtime tonics. Improvement of circulation. Camphor, which is found in sassafras, seems to have the ability to improve blood circulation and allow more cold and warm feeling sensations to return. And so this, there's a long article here that talks about there are some downsides of too much sassafras, of course, like with everything. It's too much moderation in all things, right, G.D.'s Boo? You mentioned spice bush. Well, how many people have heard of spice bush? Well, it is a uh, Loris benzoin is the fancy name for it. It's part of the laurel family. There's lots of laurel in the mountains, as you know has a wide range of uses as household remedies, especially of the treatment of colds, dysentery, and intestinal parasites. The bark is aromatic, astringent, diaphoretic, debrifuge. In other words, if you have, uh, you were talking about seven-year itch, this is one of the things you treat it with, treat it with. A stimulant and a tonic. The oil from the fruits have been used in the treatment of bruises and rheumatism. A tea made from the twigs, a household remedy for colds, fevers, worms, and colic. You can take a steam bath with spice bush, and that makes you perspire in order to ease aches and pains in the body. The young shoots are harvested during the spring, can be used fresh or dried. The bark is diaphoretic and vermifuge, and once widely used as a treatment for typhoid fever and other forms of fever. So, in other words, you can shed your skin using that. I think that's those fancy words, that's, that's what that's all about. This one article shows you what the edible parts of a spice bush are. So all these things exist in nature. And G.D.'s Boo was just talking about it all. And the benefits of sulfur. Sulfur is a big deal. It helps your hair grow. It prevents hair loss. You can kill bed bugs, chiggers, dog mange, and all these sorts of things can occur with sulfur in addition to the fact that it is very beneficial for your system internally other than that all right Gigi's boo we got something one more th oh yeah well let's talk about mare's milk you mentioned mare's milk so let's talk about what who in the world would drink horse milk well, a lot of people do apparently and it's very important in many cultures and it's a key part of natural healing in certain religions there are impressive nutritional components of horse milk it has very high levels of vitamin A, B family vitamins, vitamin C, and vitamin E. And they're in far higher concentrations in horse milk than in cow's milk. It's also a notable provider of potassium, iron, calcium, and magnesium. There are only 88 calories in 7 ounces of mare's milk, but there's 130 calories in the same amount of cow's milk. And it's particularly low in fat. And the only fat it contains is monounsaturated. So lots and lots of benefits to include treating eczema, aiding, aiding digestion, improving bone health, reducing blood pressure, detoxifying the body. All these things are there, and we don't hear much about it. But Judy's Boo's got one closing story to talk about that's fascinating. And we've got plenty of time, so go ahead with that, Judy's Boo. Okay. Thank you. I, I wanted to touch on this. This is something that's not talked about nowadays too much, and I don't know if any of you have ever heard of this or not, but it's the Sin Eaters in the Appalachian Mountains. Throughout history, many professions have risen from death rituals, including our undertakers and morticians of the day. And back in the old days, they had professional mourners. They even talked about that in the Bible that were hired to well lamentate the passing of a family member, while other people set up with the dead until time of the burial. 
while sin eaters were paid for their services. It was a very small amount of money, and there was a lot of dark stigma attached to the sin eaters who were believed to carry the sins they ate along with them, the sum of which made them unclean and evil in the eyes of their neighbors who shunned them. There's been a lot of questions put forth of who eats the sin eaters' sins. And from everything that I can encounter, my mother saw one one time. The sin eaters' soul was just damned to eternal hell. And you've got to remember, in the Appalachian Mountains, this this sin eater thing started in ancient Egypt and Greece, and it also stems from the Catholic rite of absolution, the forgiveness of sins by the priest, as near the time of death as possible. In order for those who died unexpectedly to be absolved, the sin eaters became common in Wales and Ireland in the 18th to 19th century. And the immigrants brought us with them to the Appalachian Mountains. The ritual of sin eating varied by region to region. The sin eaters in the Appalachian Mountains usually lived in a remote area away from other people. The practice was somewhat taboo, and few accounts really survived. The sin eater seemed to, in some cases, they said, could be an anonymous member of the community, and his identity was secret while he lived in regular life in the community. That's not so. My mother said that was not so. The sin eater would be somebody who was like a recluse who lived in a cave or a shanty or whatever, and he depended on the earth to give him what he could have. Uh, If he was paid, he was paid very little. And if he wanted to buy something, he had to holler. You just didn't go on to his area where he lived. He would holler and tell somebody, you need such and such and such from something, and he would give them the money and they would pay for it. He would be summoned to the death of a loved one, and he'd enter the home. Now, my mother said when she was there and the sin eater was called, they turned their back. They didn't look at him. They had fixed a plate and had passed it over the body and had set it down, and the sin eater came in and ate the food. They sometimes had fruit laid out so that he could eat something later. Some sin eaters, they said, would take the plate off the corpse chest. Now, she said it was passed over the body, and it was put down for him to eat with their backs turned. And when he got through eating, there was money laid out for him, and he took the money. He's dressed all in dark clothes, usually with a hood, had a full beard, black coat, black pants, everything. He represented the sins. When he ate, the sinner would say something to the effect of, I give easement now to thee, and for thy earthly sins, dear woman slash man, I pawn my own soul. His job was done, and he left without saying another word, only to appear again when he was summoned. They say that it died out in the 20th century, and only a handful of reports continued to the 1930s. Now, Mama was a child in the 50s, and she saw this, so it was still prominent. People will say, why did they have a sin eater when they had a preacher, and the preacher taught them about the plan of salvation and Christ, the church rituals and everything? I can't answer that. It's like with anything practice or superstition is similar to spilling salt and throwing it over your shoulder and all that. I don't know why, but as Christianity grew and pastures became more abundant in the Appalachian Mountains, you might walk four days without seeing anybody. So they couldn't always have a minister to marry them or preach a funeral. They had to do the best they could. Now, there's not been anything happened lately that they can document in the last decade. Although some rumors have been said that the sin eater is still present in the Appalachian Mountains. It could be. I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to see one. If I was had been 
a child, my mom was braver than me, I probably would have screamed grand. If you want to see something as close as you can get to the actual Sin Eater, is get the DVD. I think Gary's got a link he could drop in. It's on YouTube. We looked it up. The Last Sin Eater. The town or the community that this Sin Eater is living in, there's a little, there's a dark secret that's been kept. And I don't want to give the plot away what the secret was. Let me just say the Sin Eater was not supposed to be the Sin Eater. It was supposed to be somebody else, but it was really good. Mama got it and wanted us to watch it because that's history that's left. We don't have that part of history anymore. And thank God we don't because I'm telling you, I would not stand around. That would scare me to death. Yeah. And like so many things, uh, based on these these traditions, you can usually go back and find a rational source from where these things originated, certainly with the you know, it's still an open question to me about how native people and uh, rural people of old times ago mm-hmm. knew how knew about these herbs and all these plants, how they knew how to put it together and make it work. I mean, I'm sure it wasn't by trial and error because we probably wouldn't be here today if that were the case. But somebody knew something somehow. So I always try to go back and find out, okay, what do these things really do for you? And so I did the same thing, trying to look up the, what, you know, sin eating. Where, where, where could that possibly have originated? Because it is, it is quite an unusual tradition. And it goes back for a very, very long time. It goes back into Europe. It was active at least in the 18th and 19th centuries. Uh, the churches were against it, so it suggests that it evolved independently of at least the Christian mm-hmm. church. And I did find that it could have been related to an old Jewish tradition where they would use a goat as a physical manifestation of the sins of the Jewish people and would release the goat into the wilderness during Yom Kippur. I'm not real I'm not really feeling that real strongly because I'm trying to understand how that could jump from a goat to an individual man or woman. And so, you know, no, no, it's, a, it's an interesting story. I had do hit, like Brenna said, I do have the link for this video. It's not a great copy. It's a free one, though. <laughs> it's a free one on YouTube. It's a real good movie. It yeah. really is. So we can, we'll can we add that into the into the broadcaster for everyone. Anyway, what else you got, Gigi's boo? That's about it except what I usually say at the end of the show. Always remember to take that road less traveled and remember I love you all big to my heart, and I mean that. Yeah, and thanks for joining us tonight on The Road Less Traveled with Carrie Ellen and Gigi's Boo on RealLibertyMedia.com, RLM Radio. And we look forward to seeing you next week, same bat time, same bat channel. RLM Radio, take care. Have a great week. Bye-bye.